This is a 2005 Lotus Elise, and it's a little British sports car. But unlike other British sports cars, this one is powered by Toyota, which means it's reliable. It's also a bargain for what you get. Exotic car, styling and performance for the same price as a well-equipped Honda Accord. Today, Kenan and I are going to review this Elise, and we're gonna show you all of its quirks and features. <laughs> Before I get started, big news, this Lotus Elise is currently for sale and it's being auctioned live on cars and bids. This Elise is solar yellow, it has an accident-free Carfax report, and it has some desirable upgrades that make it cooler, and you can buy it on cars and bids. So once you finish watching this video, click the link in the description below to head over to the live auction for this Lotus Elise where you can bid on it and buy it only on cars and bids. All right, time for the quirks and features of the Lotus Elise. And I'm gonna start with a little history, which is actually pretty interesting. So the Elise first came out back in 1996. That was the first generation model, which was never sold here in North America. Now, the Elise was named after the granddaughter of the owner of Lotus. It was a man named Romano Artioli, and he owned Lotus and Bugatti at the time. His Bugatti was responsible for the EB110, and he also created the Lotus Elise, which he named after his granddaughter Elisa. Now, the first generation Elise was sold from 1996 to 2001 before changing safety regulations in Europe made Lotus updated. When they went to create the second generation model, well, obviously Lotus didn't have enough money to do it themselves. So General Motors offered to help bankroll the second generation Elise as long as they got a version. So Lotus developed and created the Elise and General Motors got the Vauxhall VX220 and the Opel Speedster, which are basically rebodied Lotus Elises that I always thought looked a little better. All very cool cars, but that's how the second gen Elise came to be, General Motors backing. Now, the second generation Elise came out in 2001, 02, somewhere around there, and initially it was sold with a Rover-derived four-cylinder engine, and it wasn't offered in North America. The big change came for the 2005 model year when Lotus switched to a Toyota four-cylinder. That's right, this mid-engined exotic sports car was powered by a 1.8 liter four-cylinder Toyota engine. But it's not just any Toyota four-cylinder engine because it has a Yamaha head for extra performance, which means that this four-cylinder makes about 190 horsepower. Now that might not seem like a lot, but this car only weighs about 2,000 pounds. So in actuality, it's plenty for a car like this. This engine is known for its peaky performance, which means that you really have to use all of the revs to get the most out of it, which suits a sports car like this. This engine was also shared with several other high-performance Toyotas at that time, most notably the Celica GTS, but also the high-performance versions of the Corolla, Matrix, and the Pontiac Vibe. Now, we focused on this engine for a very specific reason because it's a huge selling point of this car. Up until this stage, Lotuses were questionable in their reliability department, so the fact that you could get a British lightweight sports car with a reliable engine was a huge reason to buy an Elise. The other big benefit of this engine is that it was already federalized by Toyota for use in the United States and it met all of our emission controls. That made it easier for Lotus to bring the Elise to the United States for the first time. Lotus was also able to bring the Elise to the United States because of various government exemptions regarding safety, specifically focused on the headlights, bumper, and airbags. The last of these exemptions expired in the early 2010s and it meant that the Elise could no longer be sold here in the US. Bringing the car to the United States was a really important focus for Lotus because believe it or not, half of all Lotuses ever made are the Elise and its variants. This wouldn't have been achievable if they hadn't brought the car here, so Lotus wanted to make sure that you could buy it on American soil. But anyway, next up, further on to the quirks and features of the Elise, let's talk about the key situation. So you had a key, a normal looking car key, but then there was this key fob, which was attached to your key ring with this weird rubber strap. And then the fob itself was completely unlabeled. It has two
two circular buttons that are not the same size and you don't know what they do. Well, it turns out the larger button locks the doors and also unlocks the doors. So that was lock and unlock. You might be thinking, well, what's the other button? That dealt with the immobilizer for this car. You would unlock the doors, climb inside, and if you didn't start the car fast enough, it wouldn't let you start it. It was immobilized. You had to press the smaller button to reset the alarm, and then you could start the car. Quite bizarre. Also unusual out here is the door handle situation, mainly because there isn't one. You walk up to the car, you see the keyhole sticking out, you push on that and then just pull on the door and it opens right up. You don't have a traditional door handle in the Lotus Elise. Now, once you go to open the door and get inside, something you should never do is grab onto the windshield frame. It seems very appealing because this is a low, tight sports car, hard to get in, and that can give you some balance. But if you pull the windshield frame hard enough, you can start to tweak it and get it misaligned and that screws with the whole car. You don't want to do that. You got to find some other way in. Now, once you get inside the Elise, you'll notice that it is a very tight in here. This is a little tiny car, only 2,000 pounds, so it doesn't have a lot of excess space and luxury. It also doesn't have a lot of equipment. Very basic, very Spartan, stripped down again to get to that low curb weight to make this car little and light and fast. But this particular Elise is equipped equipped with the Touring Package, which sounds very luxurious until you discover that it included extra sound deadening that the standard model didn't have, carpeting, which the standard model didn't have, leather upholstery, which was nice, an iPod connection, which I will show you later, and my personal favorite, a cargo net. Between the seats, this cargo net is some of the only storage in this interior, and that was an added goodie of the luxurious touring package. Needless to say, it wasn't really very luxurious. Now, on the subject of storage, there are a few places in this interior where you can put things, adding a little bit of practicality. That net between the seats, like I mentioned, but also this shelf where the glove box would be. You don't get a glove box but you do get a shelf. There's also a little hole to the left of the steering wheel where you can put stuff. I owned one of these and I would put my wallet in there. And you have a similar little hole over on the passenger side. So a little storage, not much, but again, lightweight, tiny car. You should be happy with what you get. Now, beyond that stuff, this car is indeed pretty basic, although there are some interesting quirks and features worth pointing out. For one thing, this has power windows, though I love the fact that they stuck the power window switch here directly on the circle for what would have been the crank window. They just had that little circle there. They figured, hey, stick the power window switch on it. It's a little bit of cost cutting. You also had an engine start button in this car, although like a lot of cars in this era, to start the engine, you stuck the key in, twisted it, and then press the engine start button. You couldn't just get in and push the button. It was a bizarre two-step process, but it was cool to push a button. Next up, another interesting quirk in this car is the stereo, which you can see here. Looks like an aftermarket Kenwood stereo that you would buy from some radio shop, but this was the factory head unit. Lotus did not have the money to develop their own stereo system, certainly not integrated into their interior, so they just bought a bunch of these Kenwood units, probably retail, and stuck them in the car. Now, the funniest thing about this stereo isn't that the head unit looks like this. It's the iPod connection. I mentioned as part of the touring package, it's this, which is a cable. It just sort of stuck out in your dashboard shelf. That's where you would attach your iPod so you could listen to music. There was no luxurious integration in a glove box like in some cars. You got a cord and you liked it. Next up, another great quirk of the Elise. I loved the tachometer in this car because it radically de-emphasizes zero through 3,000 RPM. You can see they're much smaller than the other numbers because, like Kenan mentioned before, this was a peaky engine. All the power was up top. So Lotus figured you'd always be at six to 9,000 RPM. Who cares what's going on down low in the rev range? And so they made those numbers smaller because they figured most 
people, it just wouldn't matter. Now, one surprise of this car, something you might not expect it to have, is air conditioning. You have a full range of climate controls here. Air conditioning, heat, you can adjust where the air comes out, the fan speed, surprisingly nice amenity for a car focused on ultra lightweight being so small, but it does have AC and it works reasonably well. But in case you don't want to use the air conditioning and zap that power from your engine, you also had a roof that you could take off. You can see right now the roof is off, but putting it on is actually tremendously simple, an easy one-person job. You would start by sticking these two bars in the center to give the roof some stability. Then you would go over to the side and kind of roll it into some clips on one side, and then you'd go over to the other side and roll it into the same clips over there, and then the roof was on. And taking it off, frankly, was just as simple. You'd start on one side and unclip it from those clips, go over to the other side and do the same, and then just pull the roof right off the car. Very easy, very lightweight, and then pull the bars off as well. Now, these were also offered with a hard top, a body colored hard top. Obviously, that was harder to get on and off, and you couldn't stick it in the car when you weren't using it, but a lot of these Elise models had it for people who wanted to drive them year round in cold climates would be insane. By the way, one other notable item in this interior, in the middle, you have a manual gear selector. Six-speed manual. It's the only way these cars were offered, which was the same story on Toyota models that used the 2ZZ. You could only get them with a manual transmission, and that was true with the Elise as well. Interestingly, to get into reverse, there's a little lockout. You have to lift up this part of the shifter and push it over and up, and then you're into reverse. The manual transmission in the Elise. And next up, I want to talk about the engine compartment back here. Now, when you look at it, you'll notice that there's a keyhole located on the middle. And that's because this is the only way to get in here. There's no popper. There's no handle in the interior. This car was focused on lightweight, so there are no additional cables. You stick the key in, twist it to the right, and lift up to get in the engine compartment. Now, once you've opened the engine cover, there are no hydraulic struts to keep it open, just an old school prop rod. And that's because, again, this car is focused on light weight. But once it's open, you have access to the engine, but you also have access to a storage area, which is a little larger than you might think. Despite this being a focused, purpose-built sports car, you can actually fit some stuff back here. Now, the engine and storage area share a compartment back here, but there's no frunk. It doesn't open up like you might expect on a mid-engine car like this. Presumably, that was due to some regulatory reasons that the headlights can't move, and so the only storage you get is located back here behind the engine. And finally, we move to the back where we're going to talk about badges. Now, you notice that it says Lotus emblazoned across the back of the car, but these are actually stickers. On the 2005 models, they use sticker decals to say Lotus, but on the later cars, they use actual badges. So you can always tell apart an 05 from the later cars based on its rear badge. And staying back here, you'll notice this rear wing, which is made of carbon fiber and it's adjustable. This was not a factory component on this car, and there are a couple of modifications throughout. You'll also notice this huge rear diffuser in the back to give it an even more aggressive look and presumably add some downforce. And there are also these carbon fiber side strikes that go along the side of the car, again, increasing its look and probably stability. It also has these aftermarket wheels that are painted black, again, kind of tying in with the color scheme of this car. The only mechanical modifications this one are an upgraded suspension and an upgraded exhaust. Everything else in this car is cosmetic. All right, time to drive the Elise. I gotta say, it is tight in here. <laughs> it is really tight in here. Let me preface this by saying I owned an Elise. I had a chrome orange 06, and I drove it across the country in it's 2012. Insane decision. From San Jose to Atlanta. And uh, I did it with my mom. My mom was there for, for not for two days, and my buddy Joe came with me from Denver to Atlanta. And uh, that was, in retrospect, it was bad. Yeah, I can <laughs> only the, imagine. At the time, I was 24. I was like, this is cool. I don't know how my mom did it or why. I wanted something that was exotic and reliable because I was tired of maintaining my stupid decisions. And this is exotic and reliable. Right. And the cool thing about it became, at that time, and I wrote this article that has become kind of the stuff of legend, was that you could buy one of these for 30 grand, sell it for 30 grand, and never really lose, I mean, you'd pay to maintain it, but you never really lose much money. Now, they've become more valuable, actually. So now it's like 35. But even so, like, what are you gonna get that handles right. like this, looks this exotic, is reliable, is reliable. manual transmission, I mean, like, there's just very little that even 
it now all these years after this car came out that like rivals it. I came out of a Porsche for this car. I came out of a 911. Uh, when I was 24, I had a 911 as a company car because I worked for Porsche. And I, going to this, this always felt more fragile. Like yeah. it's little and low and the, the clamshell, if it gets damaged, is expensive. Right. It was, it never had like the substantive feel of a Porsche. It was never the luxury car of a Porsche. But I think a lot of Lotus owners would say that was the, draw. the point. Yeah, that's what they were looking for. Lightweight, there's no substitution for a low curb yeah. weight. If you want a light tossable car, in the old school of like a light tossable car. Not like modern days where it's like, oh, 3,500 pounds, that's nothing. Like the actual old day light tossable car, you have to give up stuff. Right, you have to make sacrifices. I mean, a lot of consumers just aren't going to do that anymore. Right. But man, if you are, this is just, This is the car. This is it. Manual steering, which is quite so good. good. Yep. Very well connected. And the cool thing about the steering, in addition to being manual steering, the car is so light and little, you just can do anything with it and go anywhere at any speed. Woo! And you're just, you just know, get endless confidence. It's not just that the steering is good, the car just grips and grips. Even though it has fairly little tires, they're all, they're positioned perfectly at the corners and it's just perfect. And then that cam comes oh. in very late, there it is. Woo! I know that, that man, this engine, like I said, is known for being peak. This engine is peaky. So peaky. It's so much fun. I owned the car for like six, like a month before I read somewhere, like, oh, you got to really rev it out to get into that extra power. Because as a 24-year-old, I thought, this is really fast, even below 6,000 RPM. But then when you get up there, then you're like, woo You can actually hear it. And I also really want to give a major shout out to the powertrain, which yeah. was a massive reason I chose to buy this car. And you know, it wasn't just that it was reliable, it was like actually suited the car. Like this yep. peaky, ridiculous, buzzy, it's what it should have had. And so it was like the perfect marriage. I've always felt the Evora's powertrain is good, but like it wasn't developed as a performance car engine. Right. And you kind of feel that a little. This, this is, yeah, this, it's all about the experience and just the top end. And yeah, yeah, and yeah. That's exactly what you want in a sports car. Especially a little sports car. Like, yeah, I'll do top end because it's a light car. It doesn't take that much work to get up there. No, and the, the enjoyment comes from using all of it. And the other yeah. thing is, like, you can't. Like, this is still a very, still a pretty quick car. Yeah. But you're not going to, like, it's not so fast where you're just going to be constantly worried about getting, like, losing your license driving it. It's just but you can quick. floor it everywhere floor and everywhere. so on. Yeah. Have a great time. I think there's a million great things about this car. I think that it doesn't work for most people's lifestyle. If it's a fourth car, which is what I always said, it's like a fifth car, a sixth car. That's what it is. Definitely. If it's that, it's like the greatest sixth car in the world because there's no other regular car that will equate to this experience. Well, more importantly, with like with all the safety stuff we have these days, it probably will never be anything like yeah. this again. Yeah. This is it. And you know, I hear people with Boxsters sometimes talking, oh, my car's like a go-kart, it's so little and so light. Yeah, come drive this. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is, this a, is go a go-kart. And so that's the 2005 Lotus Elise, a cool exotic sports car that turns everybody's head, but you don't have to worry about it breaking down all the time. You just have to worry about fitting inside. <laughs> and you can buy this one on cars and bids. Anyway, now it's time to give this Elise a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 55 out of 100, which places the Elise here against some relevant cars. These are amazingly fun, eager little cars, but they're tremendously compromised. And you can see the Elise earns a hugely high weekend score, beating out even the Honda S2000, but a far lower daily score because it's just not really a dailyable car. However, if you want something fun for a weekend trip in the canyons, this reigns supreme. It looks amazing, it's surprisingly reliable, and it doesn't really depreciate. So you can own and drive it without spending a Fortune. Think of it as a budget Ferrari that you won't feel guilty when you use. Ah!